In this lecture, we're going to take a little bit closer look at the structures of solids. Broadly speaking, we can categorize solids into one of two groups. Those that have a crystalline structure, like we see over here on the left-hand side for the quartz polymorph of SiO2, and amorphous solids, which we might associate with things like glasses or polymers. And here we have a sample of obsidian, which is also referred to as a volcanic glass, because when the magma from the volcano cools very rapidly, the atoms are not able to adopt a crystalline pattern before they freeze. Now, at the atomic or microscopic link scale, crystalline solids and amorphous solids look different in the following way. In a crystalline solid, the atoms are going to be adopting a regularly repeating pattern. It's kind of like using a bunch of identical bricks to build up a wall. And this feature on the macroscopic link scale gives crystals these characteristic shapes. We see here that the crystals of quartz are these hexagonal columns that are coming out of the, the main mass of quartz here. And the crystals have regular facets which reflect the repeating pattern of atoms at the microscopic link scale, you know, much like you might see in a gemstone. In contrast, in an amorphous solids, there might be very similar local bonding as what we see in a crystal. However, there is no long-range repeating ordered pattern of the atoms. And that's why there's no clear facets or specific shapes to glasses like obsidian. Here's another view of it at the atomic link scale. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at a crystal. This would be a two-dimensional projection of the structure of quartz. And we see very readily that you have a bunch of hexagons. And that hexagonal pattern is repeating as we move through the crystal. Each silicon is actually surrounded by four oxygens in a tetrahedron. And each oxygen is bound to two silicons in uh, what is a, a linear or bent geometry. This is a two-dimensional projection, so we're only seeing three of the oxygen bonds to silicon. If we were to look at an amorphous SiO2, like might be the glass in the window in your house, still most of the silicons are forming the same number of bonds to oxygen and vice versa. However, there are some mistakes in such a way that we don't have this nice repeating pattern anymore. So that is, at the end of the day, what differentiates a crystalline solid from an amorphous solid. Here is another image. Here we're looking at sodium chloride, or table salt. And so we see on the left-hand side crystals of uh, sodium chloride, millimeter-sized crystals. If you took just the salt from the salt shaker at your home and put it under a microscope, you would see also cubic crystals. They just would be smaller. Those crystals are cubes because we see over here on the right the pattern of sodium and chloride ions that make up of sodium chloride at the atomic link scale. And of course, this crystal only has a few atoms, what I'm showing here, but in something that's big enough that you can see it with your eye, there would be you know many, many, many atoms, but it would still have this kind of cubic shape. Now let's dig just a little bit deeper and think about the shapes of the repeating unit. Okay, In a crystalline solid, the pattern that is repeated over and over again, think about it as the brick that's used to make the wall, we're going to call that a unit cell. And the unit cell will contain one or more atoms, and when we put all of those together, then we're going to get the crystal structure. Let's start by thinking about a two-dimensional system, because it's just easier to visualize. And in fact, there are, as we'll talk about before the end of the lecture, examples of solids that really exist as two-dimensional entities. Now, in two dimensions, let's just think about how many different shapes we could use to tile all the space. Think about the kind of tiles you might see on a floor. You can have, of course, squares to tile space. You could have rectangles to tile space. You could have hexagons that tile space. You could have rhombuses, like are shown here, that tile space. 
or you could use a parallelogram like shown here. So these five shapes are really the only shapes that you can use that you repeat them over and over again and you're not rotating them or doing something else fancy to them that will tile space. And each one of them gives rise to a distinct kind of lattice. So if we put a lattice point in this square tiling pattern, we could put a lattice point at the center of each cell, or we could put it on the corner of each cell. Either would work, but in either case, we get this repeating unit, which is a square. And, and the lattice is defined by the lattice vectors, A and B, and by summing up any combination of A and B, we can get to any lattice point here. Okay, but the bottom line is if we have atoms that were arranged with this pattern, it would be a square lattice. If A and B are of different lengths, then we get a rectangular lattice. In the hexagonal case, this is kind of an interesting one because in two dimensions, our unit cell, our repeating brick, it has to be a parallelogram. So although we're tiling space with hexagons, the unit cell is actually this parallelogram that's shown here. So the lattice vectors A and B, the edges of the parallelogram, are equal in length, and the angle between them is 120 degrees. For the rhombus, A and B are equal, but the angle between them is no particular angle. It's not a right angle, it's not 120. And then, of course, for the parallelogram, A and B are different from each other, and the angle is arbitrary. So these are the two-dimensional lattices. Now, one thing before we leave this the rhombus, or the rhombic lattice, as it's sometimes called, is kind of interesting because we could also draw a rectangle with lattice points at the corner and in the center. And that would be an equally valid representation of a unit cell. And so because of that, this lattice is oftentimes called a centered rectangular lattice, meaning that we have lattice points at the corners of the unit cell and in the center. We're going to see that again when we go to three dimensions. Now, when we go to three dimensions, there's more possible shapes that we can use to pack together to build our crystal. So it turns out there are seven different shapes of the unit cell that we might encounter in a three-dimensional system. Uh, some of them are pretty intuitive. We can see this one that's called cubic because the unit cell is just a cube. And the base of the unit cell is a square, and all of the faces are squares. The tetragonal, of course, is very similar with orthogonal lattice vectors, A, B, and C. But in this case, one of the lattice vectors is a different length than the other two. And that makes some of the faces of our unit cell rectangles and other squares. If we go to the orthorhombic system, now all six faces of the unit cell are rectangles. Um, we can also have you know, this hexagonal system where the base looks just like our hexagonal lattice in two dimensions, or the rhombohedral crystal system where each face of the unit cell is a rhombus, and so on and so forth. Okay, You don't have to memorize these, but it's just so you can get a grasp of the kinds of patterns that we see in three-dimensional crystals. Now, just like we saw in two dimensions that we could have a centered rectangular lattice, it turns out that in three dimensions, we can also have centered lattices. And those lattices come in a couple of different flavors. The two most common are shown here. If we have only lattice points at the corners, we would call that a primitive lattice. So here we see a primitive cubic lattice. If we add an additional lattice point at the center of the unit cell, so at the corners and at the center, we would call that, rather intuitively, a body-centered lattice. And then finally, if we added another lattice point, not at the center of the unit cell, but at the center of each of the six faces of the unit cell, we get this lattice shown here, which is a face-centered lattice. Now what I'm showing here are the body-centered and face-centered lattices for a cubic crystal system, but you could also have them for other crystal systems. There is a face-centered orthorhombic lattice. There is a body-centered tetragonal lattice, so on and so forth. We're not going to get into those details, but all you really need to remember is that we can have both primitive lattices and centered lattices. Okay, a lattice, all by itself, is not yet a crystal structure. 
It's just the scaffolding from which we're going to build the crystal structure. But to get a crystal structure, we have to associate either an atom or a group of atoms with each lattice point. So let's just do a couple of simple examples here, and I'll show you how this works. We're going to stick to two dimensions because it's going to be easier to visualize. So let's start with a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice. So all of these little black dots, those represent the lattice point. Here is our unit cell, denoted by the lattice vectors A and B, and it's this parallelogram, and there's a 120-degree angle between the vectors A and B. We're going to now take a single atom, a zinc atom, and we're going to put one of those atoms on each lattice point. One of the rules for building a crystal structure from a lattice is that all of the lattice points have to be identical. So if one lattice point has a zinc atom on it, then all of them have to have a zinc atom on it. Let's just do an animation to show what that might look like. So you can see we're going through and we're putting a zinc atom on each lattice point, kind of accelerating it here a little bit, and then we would get a structure like this. Ideally, this lattice would go on infinitely in both directions. Of course, in a real crystal, it will eventually come to an end. But we get this pattern, which is, by the way, the closest way to pack spheres in two dimensions. And, and you can see it's a kind of a hexagonal kind of pattern. Okay, So we're going to come back to that, actually, in the next lecture when we talk about the structures of metals. Let's do another example now with the same lattice, with this primitive two-dimensional hexagonal lattice, but now we're going to change the motif. We're going to change the group of atoms that we associate with each lattice point. Instead of having one zinc atom, now we're going to have this two carbon atoms arranged in this pattern. Now, when we say we have a motif associated with each lattice point, two carbon atoms associated with each lattice point. It doesn't mean that they have to be on the lattice point. It just means that everywhere there is a lattice point, they have to be the same distance and direction from that lattice point as all of the others. So another way to think about that is inside our unit cell, we're going to put these two carbon atoms. And then every unit cell has to be exactly the same as the others. Every brick that we build the wall from has to be exactly the same. So let's fill in the other unit cells now. Okay, so you can now see a pattern emerging. And one of the things when you look at this pattern is you should be able to start to see these hexagons of carbon atoms. Let me just draw that in, and then we can start to draw on the hexagons everywhere. Okay, and so even though we have a two-atom motif, each carbon atom is actually bonded to three neighbors. And we don't really see anything that looks like a molecule in here, right? It is actually bonds all the way throughout the solid. This pattern, which also looks like a honeycomb or maybe like chicken wire to you, this is the structure of the two-dimensional solid graphene. And if we were to stack a layer of graphene with a bunch of other similar layers, we would get the structure of graphite. And that's one of the common forms of carbon. But notice that the covalent bonds go throughout the entire structure here. There's no such thing as a molecule in here. And the other thing to know is that there's no reason why an atom in one unit cell can't make a bond to an atom in the next unit cell. And so that's something we want to keep in mind when we look at the structures of three-dimensional solids in the next lecture. Maybe just to summarize and give you a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, we could think about how these lattices and motifs relate to the structures of the common kind of solids we talked about in the last lecture. So for metallic solids, we often have quite symmetric and simple structures. Oftentimes, we might have only one atom on each lattice point, like we have in this face-centered cubic structure, much like that zinc two-dimensional pattern I showed you. For an ionic solid, of course, in that case, we have two different kinds of atoms. Like, if this is the structure of sodium chloride, we have a chloride ion and we have a sodium ion. So our motif has to be at least two atoms, and that's what it is. 
And it may not be that obvious to you, but look how the green chloride ions are in exactly the same pattern as the metal atoms in our metallic solid. And so both of these are a face-centered cubic lattice, but the difference is we have a two-atom chloride sodium motif that goes with each lattice point. If we come down here to the structure of diamond, a network covalent solid, once again, we actually have a face-centered cubic lattice. Once again, here we have a two-atom motif, much like we did with the structure of graphene that I showed on the last slide. So if we put this carbon atom on a last point at the corner of the unit cell, then it always comes with this one, which is not sitting on the boundary of the unit cell. And we do that everywhere, just like we have a face-centered cubic lattice, and we would get the structure of diamond. And then with molecular solids, of course, there uh, we can get all kinds of things because molecules come in various different shapes and they pack together in various different ways. So there are many possible structures. Oftentimes, they're going to be lower symmetry than what we might see for these other types of solids. Well, let's just finish up by doing an example. We're going to go back to our two-dimensional structures. And here I'm showing you two different patterns of atoms. What I want you to do is to look at these patterns and do a couple different things for me. I want you to find the unit cell, the repeating pattern that is the brick, and I want you to draw that in. Then I want you to tell me what is the name of the two-dimensional lattice, right? We learned earlier that there's only five possible types of two-dimensional lattices, so which one is each of these? And then finally, tell me well, how many of the atoms, A and B, are there in the motif? Why don't you pause the video, work through the answers, and then come back and we'll go over them. Okay, let's start with the structure on the left. I mean, when you look at this structure right away, it kind of looks like a square. I mean, I've drawn it as a square here. But what we're trying to find is the most symmetric, smallest, repeating pattern in the structure. And the unit cell actually is shown right here. It is a square, but that square is rotated by 45 degrees. If we were to look at that square, we can see that at each corner, we have one of the B atoms, and in the center, we have an A atom. And one of the properties of unit cells is if I stack them all together, they all have to be identical. So let's look at some other unit cells, and you can see, okay, yeah, they tile together, and they're all exactly the same. Okay, so this would be a square lattice, and the motif would be one atom of A and one atom of B. Now let's turn our attention to the structure on the right. Here, what's the lattice going to be? Well, you might be able to see that there's a kind of a hexagonal six-fold rotation axis here. And indeed, the unit cell is that parallelogram that goes with the hexagonal lattice, which I show here. And if we were to draw some neighboring unit cells in, you can see they're all the same. They all have the atom A on the corners of the unit cell, and then we have one of the atom B in the middle, and then two of them on this edge and two on this edge. And each of those is halfway in the unit cell. So we have one atom of A and three of B as part of our motif. So this is a hexagonal lattice, and the motif is AB3.